And now I'd like to welcome onto the stage uh, Dr. Tom Coon and Professor Stephen Carlton, who are going to probably give a bit of context to what we've just been talking about and maybe be able to answer some of those questions around um, interpretations and maybe even the rights and all those kind of fun things. <laughs> um, so I'll hand you over to them then. Thank you. Um, I think that the, the questions and answers that we've heard already have been really interesting and um, will enable us to, to move into some of the substance of what we want to then discuss together and I think with yourself. So that gives you the tenor of things very much. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I thought it was a wonderful, a wonderful question and answer session. I thought your questions were wonderful. Left, and so she can't hear. Um, I thought the response that she gave to the, was it the first question about um, historical events and contemporary resonances was a model answer. <laughs> these things, if you play it straight, these things leap out and grab you, and that's somehow much stronger than literally your production with little references to the contemporary world. And, and I love it. First thing she said she loved about breath, this is wit um, and intelligence. Because, oh, well, for all sorts of reasons, because he's German, because he's a communist, people expect him to be ponderous and dull and grey. Uh, and really, did the person get laughs? I'm really sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> it, it, is, it is a witty play, it's full of light and humorous bits, and it has to be played. He was also a, a, a temperamentally um, quite quite restrained, I think, in, in the way he told his jokes. And, and, and I think if we want to start to get into the, the real meat of this, the nitty gritty of this, we, we need to start thinking about uh, the way that he modulated uh, emotion, in fact, uh, and the, the emotional release of the joke is something that should not be allowed to to run wild uh, and to dominate things, rather emotion then in the interest of, of uh, an experience that is both emotional and intellectual needs to be channeled, not, not, to, be, not to be lost, not to be somehow suppressed uh, in the artistic experience, far from it. It's, 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 I would say we are dealing then with uh, a, a, a type of imagination that, I mean, I don't want to be Teutonic about this, but you can, I think, aptly use the term dialectical here. Um, the, the, and, and, and bear in mind that that involves a relationship uh, of um, concepts, not a, 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 a stark opposition, simply, so that um, emotion and reason uh, are uh, co present and interplay in. Realization on the stage of the text, and that, that's all rather uh, abstract. I, know, I don't want to necessarily keep things to that, but um, I think it would be useful to just to add some of that and, and understand then the, the, the very, uh, I know, cunning uh, and, and highly intelligent use of humor uh, and wit and pride. Yeah, you certainly. Left in at the deep end, but uh, <laughs> this is an untried double act. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we'll do our best to keep it going. Uh, I, I was going to say that Brecht actually also loved comic actors. <laughs> and comic actors very often automatically give you the sort of distance between character and actor. Um, but Tessa was saying she found hard to. To find the comic actors often act over the heads of their characters. They have a relationship with the audience. I mean, Frankie Howard or something like that. Maybe I'm not pitching this right for my audience. Um, <laughs> there's a nudge, nudge, wink, wink going on, which is a relationship between the actor and the audience over that head of the idiot that he's playing at the time. And, and Brecht, Brecht, Charlie Chaplin. Um, and and he, he loved lots of 
common practice in the German tradition as well, and often cast them in more serious roles. Uh, and of course, when he, is, when he went to the States, um, his first Galileo in English was Charles Lawton, who of course was a serious actor, but was also known for some of that sort of technique precisely. He was, um, I, um, there's a film called The Private Life of Henry VIII, starring Charles Lawton, which you might see on Channel 4 on a Thursday afternoon or something like that. Um, and he has that sort of almost leering relationship with the audience over the head of his character there as well. So it's Charles Lawton. Entry uh, into the world of German theatre as well, and, and to practice this, perhaps by pointing out that Beckett was also a great Shakespearean. He loved his Shakespeare, and if you like, the, the, the English tradition that we might have been thinking about uh, is, is one then uh, of, of the great Shakespearean hero, of character acting, uh, and I, I guess we've got a, a sense of that. Uh, relationship then that tends to be or should be developed between um, <clears throat> audience uh, and actor and the director might not want to disturb that too much because not least it's at the bottom. It's when Black first um, attempted to direct uh, his friend Arnold Bond's uh, play Parasite in Berlin, he, um, he, he had three really very talented actors to work with, and he absolutely terrified them. Uh, one of them locked himself in the bathroom, uh, another one broke down sobbing uh, and, and, and quit, uh, and, and the third one, Heinrich Georg, who was a gargantuan figure, uh, threw his problem book at Brecht and stormed out, and Brecht uh, sat there grinning, uh, and uh, said to, uh, uh, to well, let's just move on. Uh, and uh, the, the whole uh, production was decimated. Uh, and this was a terrible early experience for Brecht. His, he, he hadn't elaborated epic theatre at that point, uh, not at all. He, he had a, a, a sense, though, that um, that, that theatre of emotional identification uh, in, in a rather uncomfortable Way, was part of, was a fundamental part of the problem uh, that uh, modern European theatre, not just German theatre, modern European theatre had. Uh, it's become purely a, uh, a, a, a forum for uh, entertainment. The notion of uh, drama as a spectacle, both pleasing and instructive, he felt and degenerated. Uh, and, uh, he was talking about guess, the world at a particular juncture, the end of the First World War, uh, where clearly an awful lot of things have degenerated, broken down. Uh, and um, uh, the threat of the 1920s then, that the encounter is one who is seeking to, to build a fresh notion of art in a new society. It was a great avant gardist ambition there. <coughs> Uh, and uh, it says then that um, <clears throat> that 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 playing to the audience on the heart of the great actor is has had its day. We need to think harder about things. And all this goes to the grain, I must say, of quite a bit of European avant-gardeism at the time. But he's not altogether alone. He blatantly brings them um, some some extraordinary sharpness. And Awareness, which for me, uh, as a recent French biographer, uh, has a lot to do with the, the particular sensibility that uh, he, he developed, which can be traced really all the way through his life, uh, and which finds, finds an artistic home, if you like, in the 1920s in, in the in the avant garde. Should, should we should we go back to the beginning? Um, <laughs> <laughs> We entirely haven't begun. <laughs> this is Stephen Parker, <laughs> who is professor of German at Manchester University and has just written a biography of Brecht, which is one reason to be here and makes him a particular expert in all of this. He's 
so, he's also someone who's worked a lot on the period and the continuities in the period of German literature and culture from the Weimar Republic and through the Nazi period and into the post-war regimes of East and West. And of course, Brecht was somebody who lived through all of it, and, and one could throw him a novel. He brought up in the Kaiserreich in Wilhelm in Germany, um, born in the 1890s, experienced the First World War pretty much from afar, um, it has to be said. The First World War didn't come to Germany in quite the way that the Second World War did, um, but his, certainly his school friends um, went to the front, many of them were killed, his brother. So on. Um, then he lived through this period, which I guess we're talking about now, of the 1920s, and um, experienced the rise of Nazism, went into exile, came back to the GDR. So he lived through this extraordinary period of German European history, and his work is marked by that. Sorry, I was introducing you, but it's because, it's because you've worked on that, um, on that period, and the continuities in that period. Brecht, of course, is a central figure in all of that. Makes you an ideal conversational partner. You can tell me so far as. You are um, a colleague that I've enjoyed working with now for some years um, in matters of Brecht. Uh, and I guess if we're thinking about where we've both come from, your your Oxford doctorate um, with Elizabeth Crowder. Um, on uh, German exile drama uh, in Cuba. Uh, and so we, we, we have that, uh, that, that shared interest. Uh, I think it goes back a long way. Tom uh, is, is now uh, playing very important roles. He has, for, for quite a few years now, in uh, mediating uh, Brecht's reception in the English speaking world through uh, a role that John Willard famously played uh, for several decades uh, from the 1950s through, gosh, into the 90s, well into the 90s, when Newton, I think, joined him uh, in working on uh, one or two translations of plays in English. And gradually, I guess, you, you took on that role that John had played. And, and it's one that has been um, producing quite extraordinary things, as I've got to say, recently, and there's a lot more about to appear, which uh, makes things, I think, very exciting. Now, I've been very fortunate to be able to produce my biography with Bloomsbury, Matthew the Drama, and then Tom is the academic uh, advisor for. Yes, I, I'm, I'm afraid I could say things about copyright situation, but since I'm aware that this is being recorded, I probably won't. <laughs> there are lots of stories to be told of, of Barbara Brecht and indeed all the other people involved in all of this. And it's great that the um, performance rights are... Well, she's softened over the years a little bit, and she's found people that she can trust to manage the rights on her behalf. Made a lot possible, um, both in terms of publications and in terms of productions, and it's fantastic to be part of that and to be able to help it along. Um, we haven't prepared this, as you can probably tell, but we did have a first question. <laughs> so I'm going to pop the question now. In the course of writing a biography, what five things? Could be less. I could only see the three, by the way, when I tried to do this myself. All five, all millions. What are the five most important things about Brecht that you think it's useful for someone coming to Brecht and you, or for the first time, to bear in mind? So they're coming to Brecht reading him, or going to the theatre, or indeed participating in the production. Okay, well, thanks. And so I have had some time to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> you, you, you'll see when you read my biography that there are five parts to it. Um, 
<laughs> so uh, I, shall, I shall just talk about one uh, element. The, the, the first part is not really too much about uh, theatre. Uh, it's, it's, it's called Lyrical Awakening. Uh, and um, I, I was, I'm not given to um, assuming at the outset that someone I write a book about is a genius. I, I, I don't play that game, uh, and I'm pretty resistant to it. As, as, I, as I looked at the young left, I realised that things were going on which were really, truly extraordinary. Uh, and um, I, I realised that this was someone who, from really quite an early point in, in, in teenagers, in that term, teenage years, was was, was writing, uh, writing every day, uh, and, and writing things in a notebook which were virtually ripe for for publication. Uh, and this was this was really quite extraordinary. Uh, and, and a lot of what he was writing. Uh, was was poetry. Lots of lots of ballads. Um, the, the the traditional narrative form uh, of verse uh, was was just produced with extraordinary facility by by this young guy. Uh, and and he, he, he actually then did that for the rest of his life, uh, among other things. Uh, but he was really just a, a, a very very great poet. Uh, and um, the, the, the edition, the German edition of 30 volumes has several volumes devoted to poetry. And uh, I emphasize the, 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 the ballad form because that was the, the first narrative uh, form, really, that, that uh, Brecht, Brecht used. Uh, and um, he, he translated that, he, he developed the dramatic corollary. Uh, of that over time, uh, and did it in an extraordinary way. So, um, just to, to touch briefly on the on the drama, when when he came back to Europe from uh, exile in the U.S. and met up again with his friend from school days, Caspar Nier, who was his set designer, uh, they did um, <coughs> a, a um, an adaptation of Antigone. And they worked together on it, and, and, and Nia just realised the way that Plech was was still working after all these years was then to keep in his head three or four possible versions of the trajectory of the various scenes. He could he could just do that. He had that, as I would see it, a simple genius. So uh, there, there are so many versions we, we heard. Mother and so many versions of, of all the plays, is because Black had them all in his head in, in different forms and used them at different times. Uh, so, the genius. Yeah, it's, it's always difficult, and the idea of genius is quite difficult in any context. It's probably easier if we think about music and we think of Mozart you know, whistling his symphonies to himself as he played billions um, and then laboriously having to write them up afterwards. Um, in relation to the written word, it's sometimes a little bit more difficult to think in those terms because you, know, you have to be able to read and write, and we can all do that. Whereas in music, there are uh, very clearly identified as separate skills. But, but yeah, in, in Brecht's case, some of this came to him naturally, I know that's a difficult word, in a way that it doesn't to the rest of us. There, there are, one of the projects I'm engaged in is translating some of that poetry, the number of poetry. Um, there are 2,300 poems, or over 2,300 poems, five fat volumes that he wrote. It was just an almost daily practice. Um, and he wrote about everything, in all sorts of forms, not just ballads, but really almost every imaginable form. Um, and in those early end books, stuff pours out at some periods. It's unimaginable how somebody could be doing this. There are lots of writers who have written more. You sometimes, you know, if you go to the library and you look at the complete works of Balzac or, or Trollope, to take an English example, you cannot imagine how they have time to eat. <laughs> how physically could you write that much in a lifetime? Breath's not quite like that, it's 30 volumes. But 
But there's an abundance and variety in those 30 volumes, which it's quite difficult to, to grant. And that's why I have enjoyed working on Brecht for such a long time, because I don't feel I'm working on the same thing. Um, the, the works are so different. On the, the works that are simply on here or have been on here at this festival, the mother, the threat of the opera, the Galileo, if you came to them ignorantly and separately, you really wouldn't think they were quite the same person. There isn't that sort of tone that you immediately recognize with so many writers. You know, uh, great writers as well. Um, Beckett, the other great dramatist of the 20th century, um, Beckett is immediately recognizable. Um, there are repetitions of the same obsessions, the same things going on in very similar ways. It doesn't make him any less great. But in Brecht's case, it's not like that. Really, you could add another half dozen titles to those three, and you'd still think, is this the same guy? How did he do it? How did he do it? <laughs> um, some people said he was a plagiarist. Uh, and uh, there are quite a lot of adaptations, but then uh, there are in the history of drama. Uh, that's the way quite a lot of people work. Uh, Shakespeare, thank you. Who was Shakespeare? Yes, we don't know too much. We uh, can, I think, assume that he worked collaboratively. Uh, and and the, the, the fact that Brecht worked collaboratively and drew on other material has often been held against him. I find it actually perverse. Uh, I think it's uh, the, the theatre is at an end of the uh, social uh, place of interaction and artistic interaction, and um, it is only uh, appropriate then that someone who is seeking to work through that medium uh, should have extensive collaboration, should uh, be looking at the body of material that constitutes the, the repertoire and be seeking to enrich it. And, and, and Brecht had uh, just brilliant ideas always in how to enrich uh, that material. And um, working, for example, with the opera uh, with Elizabeth Hauptmann, that, that's well documented. Uh, she took gains. Uh, Beggar's Opera and, and did a rough translation, but then if, if Mark uh, Redville did his new version of uh, Life of Galileo, uh, he, he, he worked on, I think, the rough English translations uh, of the, the, the two principal German versions, uh, and so similar sort of principle. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> and then he worked also, of course, with Courtois, and, and the, the, this, this collaboration on, on an existing text and giving it a, a contemporary resonance, uh, but not, not in a slavish sort of sense. In, in the setting uh, of Gay's um, Beggar's Opera becomes uh, Victorian London of, of, of high capitalism. And uh, this is written then in the mid to late 20s in, in Berlin, the south of France, etc. Uh, and it acquires a, 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 I would say, a parabolic resonance there, and, and that's, I think, the important principle that we've already uh, enunciated. So that, that's part of an answer. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a, a lot of an answer, isn't it? There are two principles there, collaboration, working collectively, um, and adaptation working on the basis of other people's texts, and indeed going back to his own, yes. adapting his own work constantly. You know, that's what things were finished, lots of writers think. Um, oh, Brecht <laughs> yeah, is it, a nightmare for, uh, for an editor. <laughs> uh, what is the author? What is the final text? What's the version that you actually give to your readers? Um, Brecht didn't ever stop. Um, every time there was a new opportunity for a publication or for a theatre production, he went back to his text and started reworking it. There's nothing he left alone. And some of these pieces, like out there, underwent quite massive transformations. Others he didn't revisit so much. Um, but that was a, a process throughout his life. And of course he borrowed other people's work. Yes, he worked he did adaptations. One of his first commissions with his first works for the theatre was an adaptation of Marlowe's in the second. Um, the Shakespearean theatre, absolutely central for, for Brecht and a lot of the techniques that 
maybe talk to people in school as Brechtian are there in Shakespeare already the prologues that tell you the plot in advance and um, all of these sorts of things, the um, actors who give direct addresses to the audience. Um, there's a lot of the epic theatre in Shakespeare already in the Elizabethan theatre. But he took all of these different influences um, and reveled in them, loved them. And yes, he was accused of plagiarism and making other people's work. But um, I think that's a very short-sighted, narrow-minded way. The other issue that you mentioned there, working collectively, there he's also, people have also um, used that as a stick to beat him with. He hadn't got enough of his own creative juice, and so he preyed on other people and exploited them. Um, it's, it just doesn't really hold up. Yes, of course, he was a dominant and difficult man to work with. I don't think there's any question of that. Um, I think I'm quite glad he's not in theatre and so to talk to himself, although you know, um, you're always supposed to want to meet uh, the people that you're working on. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not sure about that at all. But you could equally well say that the relationships that he had with other people enabled their creativity to flower, to flourish. And quite often that is undoubtedly the case. He, he had a gift for gathering around himself people who could be creative and could be creative with him, and he had to I guess, bring out the best in him. And that's true from very early on. It's one of the little pieces of work that I've done was on um, the friendships that he had around in school and uh, around the uh, creation of his first work for the theatre, Baal. Uh, and and there, the more I went into it, the more I discovered that with these friends, they would have little sort of they do role plays, have little conversations, try out in a rather sort of adolescent way, being different versions of themselves. And these got written up in some form or another in the evenings by Brecht, and then discussed amongst the group the next day. Um, and so gradually the piece was refined, if you like. It's a sort of slow improvisation almost amongst the friends, which brought the piece of literature into being. Not the lonely poet of his heart, that was never more than a friend. We have got a picture. That's really unfair on you. One of the pictures, one of the pictures that you'll see flicking past is a picture of Brecht with lots of other people in a room. And um, it, there we go. It's worth, this is worth a brief anecdote because uh, this was. This photograph was taken for a, a Berlin magazine, um, and it was in a series, a series of artists, and the series was called, I think it's in German in my head, of course, The Kunstlerlitzisch Allein, um, the artist um, communing with himself. And most of the pictures were of poets on the trees, and Thomas Mann sitting at his writing desk, and, you know, serious the way we think of creativity, and um, with a sculptor with a bus and not bang the microphone. Um, and Brecht decided to stage this as the illustration of the artist communing with himself. And he's clearly communing with rather a lot of other people as well. Uh, on the left here is actually a boxer. Uh, whether or not he could play the piano, um, we don't know. Um, but it perhaps amused Brecht to have him sitting at the and the whole thing's deeply posed. You mustn't think this is a sort of natural picture. Over on the right, we have this group of people with scripts and things on the uh, table in front of them. And revealingly, is this um, an illustration of his sexism or, or of his wit? We have Elizabeth Hauptmann sitting at the typewriter, um, which, of course, she did do an awful lot of. Um, and Brecht himself standing in the middle with his hand in his trouser pockets. Um, it's just a fascinating the way they're all looking at each other in slightly suspicious ways. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know if that was staged in that sort of detail. Um, anyway, this is the Kunstler mit sich allein, the artist communing with himself. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, you, you alluded to that um, early work you did, Tom, and, and some of that, that work, or some of it, is, is available in English uh, in a translation of the memoirs of Brecht's 
friend from teenage years, Hans Otto Münsterer. Uh, and this is really a, a wonderful, wonderful book. When, when I first thought very tentatively about um, writing a biography, uh, it, it was not least because I'd, I'd, I'd read that translation and the whole apparatus around it. There's lots of other texts around Münsterer's memoir of those early years which reflect. Uh, which uh, detail that that, uh, that sort of interaction that Becht and his circle in Augsburg then had as teenagers. And, and I would really strongly recommend this to, uh, to, to everyone. So please write down that title and, 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 and go to the library. Um, and um, <clears throat> so that, that was a very, that's a very good early example of things. And Brecht, as, as a teenager, with his school friends, created uh, literary magazines. Uh, and the, the, if, you, if you look at these things, there are names of all sorts of different uh, boys uh, in the class, but actually 80% of the material was written by Brecht. Uh, and, and so it went on as he drew people into his, uh, into his world. And they, they, they were inspired to do things that in many cases, they simply wouldn't have done otherwise. Uh, and this was uh, truly wonderful for many of them. Uh, and uh, for Elizabeth Kaufman, uh, Elizabeth Kaufman. Um, the, the, that, that experience of, of meeting Brecht in the mid-twenties was the start of an extraordinary adventure. It was a painful adventure uh, quite a lot of the time, but it was an incomparable one, as she acknowledged. And, and and so it, it went on. Uh, one of Brecht's uh, close collaborators on the first version of the Life of Galileo, and his closest collaborator was Margarita Steffin, uh, who uh, died then on the way from um, Finland uh, to uh, the west coast of the United States, to Los Angeles, uh, in Moscow in um, May. Uh, Stephine's role uh, through the, the 30s to, to that point is of great importance uh, and um, she did great work as well disseminating the first version of Life of Galileo Brecht had been hoping uh, that that work uh, would appear uh, in 1938, 1939 by then uh, published by uh, Wieland Herzberger in Prague, um, <clears throat> and Brecht was involved in a terrible, terrible struggle at the time uh, with Georg Lukács and, and other figures in, in Moscow, and he hoped that Herzberger then through um, the publication not only of Life of Galileo, but also Fear and Misery of the Third Reich, uh, Signora Caral's uh, rifles and his poems from exile and Svenborg poems would, through the sheer force of their literary brilliance and, and their political orientation, uh, actually face down uh, the, uh, the, the Moscow Camarilla, as he called Lukács and the rest. I don't think this story has been properly understood up to now uh, in Germany or in the rest of the world for that matter, uh, and uh, Stephine uh, was, was integral then to that whole um, extraordinary um, <clears throat> production of the, the very late 30s when Brecht was in the, the direst of, of straits, and Stephine herself was in the, the final throes of tuberculosis, which killed her then on the route uh, through Moscow. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a harrowing harrowing story, the whole thing, and uh, one out of which somehow uh, extraordinarily Brecht produced some of his truly greatest writing uh, in, in, it must be said, uh, considerable isolation by that point. Uh, Stephen was one of his few close collaborators by then. Yeah, and, and um, extraordinary writing by Brecht, but some extraordinary writing by Stephen herself as well. Um, they corresponded in sonnets to one another. Um, obviously, 
she again was drawn out of herself by this uh, relationship. And um, since we're plugging things just a little bit, no, it's not so much plugging things as showing you how much is going on and how exciting it is to be involved in Brecht stuff at the moment. Um, David Constantine, the poet, is putting together a program on the relationship between Brecht and Steffi um, through their correspondence and through their, their poems. Um, which will be put on in the South Bank Persons in the summer. So, look out for that as well. We have a question. We should. Sorry, we have a lot of lights in our eyes. It's hard to see. But I don't know how long you've been. No, no, do it. I just want to ask a question. I just want to ask what a feminist scholar actually, what perspective a feminist scholar is. Because there's a lot of people who are very interested in the history of the feminist movement. Absolutely, I think there's, the, there is absolutely an issue. Um, it depends what generation of feminist is partly the um, answer to your question. Um, there's a, a wonderful essay by a, a feminist critic called Sarah Lennox, um, written in the 1970s, I think, about Brecht's sexism. Um, and she concludes in a good forthright tone that we should, con should consign his sexism to the bin of history where it belongs and wrestle <coughs> from the practice what we can for our contemporary politics. Um, I wouldn't actually quite go along with that. Um, but these are hard judgments, these are hard, hard pulls sometimes. How do you, do you want to pass judgment on the relationship that an author had with the um, women around him, and what is the nature of that judgment, and from what uh, standpoint do you do it? Um, I think we have, my problem really with the exploitation story is that it accords the women remarkably little respect. They were not passive victims in any of this process. They were strong women. He sought out altogether not only the women, he sought out strong collaborators, people like Vile and Iceland were not people who just sat down and did what they were told. And I'm absolutely sure that's true of Margarita Steffi and Elizabeth Hauptmann and Hort Berlau, to name the three, well, and Helena Weigel, as well, to name the four most important um, women in his creative life. And they had a vision of their relationships, which we might look upon with condescension nowadays as being socialist utopian silliness. But they thought they were escaping precisely the fetters of conventional bourgeois relationships when they embarked on their own friendships. They thought they were setting up a new model of how to live and work together. And we need to take that seriously and honour that for, for what it was. And I think that's absolutely true on Brecht's side as well. Although it's also absolutely true that he sometimes behaved like a complete bastard. But I don't think those two things are incompatible. <laughs> <laughs> he did believe in what he was trying to do. Um, and, and the women did as well. Um, as to whether they would have had independent careers, I think the answer is, um, in most cases, they wouldn't, or they wouldn't have been terribly successful because they lived in a sexist society, not because they were dominated by a sexist man who they then got involved in. Um, that was for them one way, one way out. But the theatre is still um, um, 
relatively sexist um, environment. Not anything like as bad as orchestral music. So, but uh, can I throw something into the mix? Yeah, yeah, please. You talked about the collaboration. I have a feeling you saw me putting Brecht on a bit of a pedestal, which inevitably would happen at the gathering of such things. However, what you miss out, in my opinion, is politics and the latest question about the sexist. There's a whole gang of them. Politicians, historians, they weren't all just artists. And for example, I mean, I have in my archive about five reams of paper, which is an exchange between Brecht and one other person trying to decide the editorial for the first edition of the Rota Farm, which was a communist newspaper. Okay. That kind of detailed collaboration, where they lived in the same street, Exchanging letters five or six times a day, ricochets all the way through most of Brent's plays in terms of the collaborations, I think. And I think you must underestimate the political collaborations that are going on in parallel all the way through. I agree, absolutely. I, I, mean, the, the, I think part of my point was that these personal relationships were a microcosm of the political vision as well. And they shouldn't be seen separately, but I've said enough to turn it up to you. It's, it's a fair point, very fair point, and a, a, a central point. Um, but I, I wonder if you say to say that you're going to imagine that you're talking about it. Sorry, bring him in. I didn't disagree with him when I was in the presidency. I guess my, my, my main point would be that we remember Blecht. We, we um, read Blecht, except because he was uh, a majorly important artist. Uh, he, um, he expressed himself through drama, uh, poetry, uh, prose, principally. The, the, that, that is the prison that I've chosen, the biography into which then the political feeds all the time. Uh, and, and in that sense, I, I think you're absolutely right to, to um, emphasize that point. But that, uh, I would say, is my perspective, born of the fact that um, Blecht didn't see himself as a politician, uh, never. Uh, he, he saw himself as drawing uh, political ideas and events into, into his work. Uh, and so that, that for me is, is a watershed issue, uh, a methodological issue. When, when I write, uh, it, it enables me to, I think, treat the political uh, thread things which runs right through uh, in, in a clear way uh, through the uh, prism of the artist. Um, um, if we're talking about collaboration, let's talk also about publishing politics, bourgeois publishing politics. That was part of the problem. Brecht in his own practice, if you look at um, early theatre programmes and early um, publications very often, they list a number of authors, or they list collaborators, or they say this is a play by such and such in a version by Brecht. It doesn't have Brecht in big letters on the front page necessarily. That wasn't the point. But the publishing industry, the capitalist publishing industry, is happiest to install a singular male, okay, singular <laughs> author. And it's Gradually, through the processes, the drip, drip, drip of those pressures, that Brecht, his name has become bigger and bigger, and the others have been elbowed out, so that um, several of the most important co-writers, of what we call them that, um, are consigned to the footnotes of the most recent German edition of his works. So anyway, there should be more people up here than just Brecht's face, but I didn't know what we were going to talk about, so I just chose <laughs> Really worked uh, to great effect, always, to elbow others out of the way. Uh, that's, uh, that's well documented, uh, and uh, he was the, the singular uh, figure, uh, not uh, his friend Michael Piscator, uh, not uh, Stanislavski. Uh, these were major rivals. Blecht um, was, was t 
tenacious in the extreme uh, in um, asserting his uh, own distinctive artistic vision. Uh, and uh, the, the whole uh, debate uh, with the Bretonites through uh, around the notion of that kind of clone was effect. It really is born of his um, his, his uh, desire to outdo uh, Stanislavskian uh, approaches to theatre in, in the mid 1930s. Uh, they had some uh, really very very disheartening experiences uh, with productions, well, production of the mother, in fact, in, in New York. His his uh, exemplary Brecht uh, feared that he would be um, Formed, uh, in, in a sort of old naturalistic style, rather So like, this is the production, the, the music from which they... Yeah. <laughs> rather like um, Stanislavski recommended, uh, and he sought to combat this. He, he, he had people come to Denmark from New York to talk about the uh, production. He, he wrote very precise instructions as to how it should be performed, as in the Berlin production. Uh, and finally went out uh, there and uh, was got into such uh, horrendous arguments with the director and everyone else that he was actually barred from the <coughs> premiere uh, together with Heisler. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so uh, really that was the, the, the stakes for him to, to try to get a breakthrough in the United States at that point, which, which failed abjectly. And he went back to uh, St. <coughs> uh, and um, formulated um, the, the, the notion uh, of the fulfillment effect, uh, which, which grew out of, which clearly grew out of his whole aesthetic approach, to be sure, uh, at that point and published first uh, essays about it and, and in a production in, in Copenhagen, tried it out for time step in the same work. Uh, it's too it's too blunt an instrument as it as it, as it, uh, it must be refined. Uh, and, and it was progressively refined. Um, and uh, in that way left uh, with his uh, the, these very important plays from the mid to late thirties and into the early forties uh, really started to define uh, that, that whole uh, interaction of theory and practice that um, was then um, really only uh, properly staged then uh, beyond that was productions and cinema uh, in, in post-war Europe. There were one or two productions of Galileo, one in uh, Hollywood, one in New York, just after he left in Europe, uh, but really most of the, the, uh, the work that was done in the late 30s and early 40s then remained as in his draw uh, and, and uh, was therefore fully designed. So the, the real breakthrough came uh, in the post war um, could, could you say more about the reception of work in this country? I mean, uh, my, my theatre memory goes back to 1956. My memory is that the key moment was the Berlin Ensemble appearing in the audience there as part of the Works World Theatre Season. And that critics were then commenting on high profile London production, which is borrowed from that. I was thinking especially of an RSC production, I think it was not very true for the Ashworths. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the effect. Cinema, uh, particularly in the early 80s when there was that flourishing of political uh, documentary associated with the Lyndon Channel Four. I don't know enough about this, it sounds as if you know more about it than we do. Um, <laughs> you're absolutely right that the, the visit of the Berlin Ensemble work that transformed the theatre scene and um, the response to that was extraordinary just after Brecht's death. Um, 
and, and I will pick up as the next moment um, that, uh, well, not so much in the late 60s, perhaps as the 70s, when, um, like Glasgow citizens, um, and some of the, in 784, um, the political theatre groups started doing that. There was a wonderful production of The Mother um, done by Di Trevis in the 1980s, it must have been. Um, and I guess, not knowing anything about political cinema, that it was that cross fertilization that was the most important there. Um, but I don't know if you know. Great question. And, 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 I mean, it, it comes, the, the, the London um, impact kind of comes on the back of the um, tours that the Birmingham Ensemble started to do, first of all, to Poland, and then. Uh, to Paris, that uh, Paris was absolutely vital, winning the, the international drama competition, and people from London, uh, and perhaps even some other parts of the UK, uh, were, were in Paris, uh, Joan Littlewood, uh, and um, people around her, and, and they went to Berlin. Um, <clears throat> and they went to Berlin to, um, to, to look and see what was happening, because this was uh, really quite sensational for them uh, as a mode of production. So Sam Wanamaker went uh, to uh, look at rehearsals. Uh, John Willis then uh, went out to see what was happening. Uh, and, and so there was a, yeah, there was a delegation, a delegation of people from uh, London uh, Theatre. Uh, and the links were forged and, and then the, the major And that was true in a much more um, wholesome sense in Germany itself, uh, um, casting around for literary models and heroes. Uh, Bracken was very clearly picked out, um, and, and that generation then quite often became disillusioned with Bracken later in their, in their lives. Uh, I've come to a completely different way. I, I suppose I came to, to more as a historian. Initially, not hoping to find a guru, not looking to invest in with that sort of significance, um, and was always amused by the older generation of German critics who seemed to feel so betrayed by Brecht. I couldn't quite understand the problem. <laughs> and, and gradually, working with him over the years, I've just found more and more, which then does have a resonance for me, and it has become more important in the way 
that's what I think of the spa, I think myself. We have another question? Yeah, I mean, you seem to be describing the process of 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 the process There are sort of two things there. One, one is about explosions or waves of, of interest, and uh, I'm sure there are um, waves of interest, and it's very difficult to account for these. I mean, sometimes there's a, um, a buzz, and then it's feeble, but people start doing breath because people are doing breath, and then more people do breath. You know, it, it goes on a little bit like that. But actually, if you look at the production statistics, it's astonishingly constant. Every now and again, People say something like, nobody's doing bread. <laughs> and then you, you discover that actually they were at that point as well. There are sort of six substantial fresh productions a year, pretty constantly through in the British theatre. Substantial ones. And then, of course, always alongside lots of student and school um, projects and things like that because this work is so. Um, well suited to that sort of exploitation. So it does actually go on um, in, in a surprisingly constant way, and that's true in the German theatre as, as well. Again, every now and again they proclaim that Brecht is dead, but then when you look at the statistics, the physicists still perform. Um, it's got number of the other things. Yeah, it's used to call the drivers. This is from the UK. Tessa said about the British tradition. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely true that in um, the training of actors in, in the UK, Brecht plays quite a small part. Um, um, that's of course not true in Germany, but it's not true in most of the rest of Europe either. Um, in the United States, it's even worse if there is a scale of value here, um, and that Brecht is really not, not mentioned at all. And all the emphasis is on Yes, the method or the Stanislavskian approach, um, empathizing, being the character as far as possible. Um, and that does make it strange to do to try to do a, a fully Russian production, if you like, in, um, in this country. On the other hand, I think it's terribly important to bear in mind that what Brecht proposed was radical in the context in which he proposed it, not wouldn't necessarily be radical now. He always talked about redressing a balance. It was a question of emphasis. I don't know if you know, probably many of you know that famous tabular um, representation of the differences between epic and traditional theatre. Um, the most important thing almost about that table is a little footnote at the bottom which says this table demonstrates shifts in emphasis, not absolute differences. And it's the shifts in emphasis that are important. He didn't think that um, acting should be emotional. He didn't think that you should engage with your character. He thought that you shouldn't do that to the exclusion of everything else. That was the important thing. So you can work with, I think you can work with empathy, you can certainly work with sympathy um, and still be true if that's interested in and still do a, a breathy version of theatre. The important thing is to be able to come out and create some critical distance from time to time. And very often the text simply does that for you. Um, and the example that comes to mind is, is Mother Courage, but I'm sure there are examples in, oh well in Galileo actually, a good example from Galileo is the, um, the recantation, where 
the rest of the cast are waiting. Is he going to recant or not? It's an extraordinarily emotional moment. And Brecht draws it out and draws it out. Um, and it, of course it makes your heart beat. <laughs> and it makes you think. And then when the bell rings out and they know that he has recanted, it's a little knife <laughs> in your side. And you feel that as an audience as well. The bit of Mother, Mother Courage I was thinking of is where Catherine drums the town's throat, dumb Catherine drums the town's throat away and is shot down. A, a, a vision of helpless humanity, which has to bring a tear to your heart. There's no way it cannot. Brecht sought out those emotional moments, but the important thing is what happens next. What happens next? The next scene takes you somewhere else and doesn't just indulge that feeling and carry it forward, as Brecht thought lots of traditional theatre does, which of course it doesn't. The comic um, moments. Right, yeah, the, the example was Anthony and Cleopatra, but we had the same sort of back and forth between the emotional investment in the scene and then the distance from it. Yeah, no, Shakespeare, Shakespeare, no, Shakespeare's different. <laughs> you say we're putting breath on a You want to see a pedestal. <laughs> <laughs> Writes a lot about it. Uh, I mean, uh, interestingly, there he's he's not the most radical in his proposals for the the shape, the disposition of the of the theatre. Um, he had a fondness for a proscenium arch, um, uh, and there were early on in the nineteen twenties there were experiments with a different sort of um, theatre. He envisaged the theatre as being like a boxing ring. He said, and he wanted people the lights to be up people to be able to sit around smoking and commenting on the action as it went along. And there are, there are sort of mini realizations of that sort of thing with a, a big jutting four stage so that you do actually have the audience on three sides at least um, for the mass number of um, the measures taken or the decision that's translated. Um, but most of the theatre that he worked with was not particularly radical. I mean, Piscator is, is more radical his vision of the, the physical appearance of, of the theatre and how that engages the audience in different ways. Brett thought you could do, you could deal with the problem of engaging with the audience in different ways. I think not necessarily by physically transforming the theatre. So, I don't know if you have done another take on that. to the threat of the opera, it's 
first version of the Tournament of Nations here, uh, which um, uh, is, 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 is much more, let's say, considered, I guess, for um, these responses. Um, but uh, from then, uh, the, um, the time beyond the training off, but after that, that success, that huge success, he, he, he leaves the mainstream theatre. Works in, in um, experimental forms with, with, um, with, with school children, with um, amateur actors, uh, and uh, with, with um, workers, trade unionists, uh, away from that mainstream, and, and seeks to um, develop experimental forms of theatre that obviously is, is the people here to, um, to, to encourage. In the production, the audience becomes incidental. That it's about it's about participating in, in the production. Uh, encourage them to to, uh, to 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 act and think about their, their situation. So he, he, he's very deliberately leaving uh, that um, that mainstream world. That mainstream. He never can properly come back to that mainstream world until. So, so that, that was obviously by no means uh, an intention for the longer term. Uh, he, he would surely have um, moved them from uh, the Lehrstück back more into the mainstream and was doing so, in fact, with the writing of uh, some German stockyards. But that work was never performed on the stage. That was uh, a work that was conceived. Uh, Broader, let's say, active and more mature, uh, mature and active way <coughs> for uh, then a, a fresh interaction with uh, a mainstream or non mainstream theatre audience, I think. Uh, and so I, I sort of just put those things in sort of their balance. It's funny, I think I would have, um, I, I, it's true, I didn't um, pay sufficient attention to, in my answer, to the um, Radical avant-gardism of Brecht's experiments around 1970, um, where he does try to engage, well, yes, as, as you say, audiences. The, the audience is no longer the point, if you like. Uh, but the first performance of the decision of play I mentioned, the, the, the greatest of the last two, just to pass judgment on it, um, at the first performance of that, the chorus was the audience. There was no other audience apart from that. So we had a chorus of 400, which and I'm afraid puts the 60 <laughs> rather in the shape, doesn't it? Uh, but, but sometimes these, these, were, these were experiments. These were unfinished pieces of work. He was trying out what you could do, trying to get away from the bourgeois theatre and the, and the plush seats and all the rest of it, and trying to work out what else you could do. And it's not clear to me that that process ever came to any sort of an end. Steve's just given you an account now where he said he would naturally have started moving back into the mainstream theatre. I think I've seen that differently. I've seen 1933 when the Nazis came to power and when Brecht was forced into exile as a violent interruption in a series of experiments which actually might have continued um, and, and reached a completely different point, forcing him onto a, a different track in, in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then, of course, very much when he got back to GDR, but that's a different, different story. And at this stage, in the late 1920s and early 1930s, some of the experiments look relatively feeble in retrospect. I mean, uh, at the first performance of another of um, his last um, year, he had an audience questionnaire, which nowadays we wouldn't really think of as a very radical way of engaging your audience. But, you know, that was then. Yeah, I didn't give you a chance to talk earlier on. Then. The other night they showed this. They, they showed an old version of Bar on television production. Oh, the Barry Bowie one. Just thinking earlier, because not knowing really much about Brecht, you talked about him being perhaps antagonist or sexist. Yeah. Um, the character in Bar was very much like that, I thought. And I wonder, is it? Is it, is it, it was almost like watching a biopic of <laughs> Bertolt Brecht. Is it protected? Uh, sort of. 
it, it, autobiographical backwards. I don't it, know. It, well, it, it, it is, it's, it's sort of anti autobiographical. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something biographical. He, he uses a lot of elements from his own life in Bath, but they're not the, um, the ones that you would expect. Brecht at this age. Brecht, at the, the point at which he'd written Bach, probably hadn't had sex. I'm sure he wanted to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. Um, he certainly hadn't killed anybody. <laughs> um, he was actually quite a shy, um, difficult, awkward young man. People age or, or mature or go through adolescence faster nowadays than they did then. And in his early 20s, Brecht still betrays quite a lot of the characteristics that we might expect to see perhaps in a 16-year-old. Would you think that's fair? Is that, or is that... Yeah. Not yeah. because it's arrested development, I don't think, but because it was a different world. Um, and, and he wrote Bach to shock and upset people, and he used little fragments of his own experience, but he turned into something completely different. Um, and I think there is a certain amount of sort of adolescent bravado in, in the piece. So it's uh, um, at that stage of his life, it's perhaps a way he quite likes to see himself. He was a poseur, as you see from many of these, these mm -hmm. pictures. He liked to cast himself in different roles. And that's why, actually, David Bowie is a wonderful Bach, <laughs> because he, he shares some of that, that desire to be protean um, of, of the original Brecht. I love the way he delivers some of the songs as well, with that sort of edge of cynicism. Wonderful business, like the one before this, like yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. Um, I mean, Boat was, you know, much influenced by his experience in, in Berlin and his own development, and it's it's not an accident that he latched onto to Brecht, and it's not an accident that he was asked to play his part. He does it does it very well indeed. I, I, I would compliment what, what you say on by by saying that. Baal is part of a, a, a pretty consistent uh, projection, self-projection of Tibetan poetry and, and, and drama at that time into the, uh, I know the role of the hedonist. Uh, and the hedonist in Brecht is, is, is a constant uh, in one way or another. He tries to, he, he tries to kill Baal again and again in rewriting. Uh, writes it as the you know, life story of the asocial man Baal who's, who's, who's terrible, um, I don't know, who's, who's, whose ways, whose asocial ways are exposed then as uh, simple residues of, of, of the bourgeois culture that he's going. But he, he doesn't succeed in this. And, and, and there is, uh, if you look at um, the, the, the way Baal is described, the skull of Socrates is, is invoked. As it is with uh, Galileo, uh, very interestingly, that and that other creature of appetites much later. And, and, and so there's this, this strand of, of the, the hedonist there that left would sort of part of him would have loved to be, but it was all too dangerous actually for someone, both of his, his, his temperaments and of his physical makeup. Um, he didn't he, drink. He, he couldn't. He had a. He, he had a kidney complaint, uh, which, which um, made, made that uh, hazardous. But he was also a bit frightened of losing control, wasn't he? Well, completely. He, he, was, he was physically really not in very good shape almost ever. Uh, and so, um, have we got a photo of Brecht and Charles Morton? Oh, no, That's a shame, because... Brecht is honestly gazing at Charles Lawton's tummy, which, which is not small, and, and, and in, in envy, I would say, in some envy. But, um, can, can, I take up, sorry, can, can I take up Galileo? Because you threw Galileo to the mix, and we, it's easy to think of Brecht's work as as not actually betraying very much of the man, as being impersonal, I would actually have add to um, our explanation of how he managed to, to write like this, is by sometimes keeping his work at arm's length to a greater extent in some writers. But another place where there's something of a self-portrait 
is in Galileo. It's only something of some portrait. There's a hell of a lot else going on in Galileo as well. I wouldn't want to go along and think any more than Baal is a self-portrait. Galileo is not a self-portrait. But there's a, there's a critical, skeptical view of himself here. There's a view of a man who might well be a sexist. There's a view of a man who likes the experimental method um, and tries to apply it to his work. There's a view of a man who works collectively in teams but dominates them at the same time. Um, so it, it's not a, um, if I'm right at all in saying that it's a self-portrait, it's not a self-glorifying self-portrait. It's a much more doubtful one than that. But I think there is a little bit of breath in the camera there. Yeah, and, and, and it almost gets more complicated than that. Um, so if, if there is a projection of the heavens, um, that one would be, or isn't really, in, in, in bar of the whole uh, succession of figures and human facts, uh, uh, that there is also uh, the other poem, uh, which is the, the skeptical, cerebral, intellectual that that would be uh, her koina. Uh, if you know the, the, the koina stories, uh, they, they, um, they, the, the, the opposition of our koina, really for me, exemplifies uh, less, something that's quarrel with himself as to how one can be in this world and how one might be. Uh, and it finds embodiments in all sorts of dramatic oppositions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I'm not seeking to uh, produce here an interpretation which is pure work. I think you are taking a map on. To these things have to be both fully uh, far. Yes. Can I come back to Baal for a moment? Um, I, I saw the film as well for the first time, uh, and um, I was struck by something that two ladies behind me were saying afterwards, and that was um, um, a clear Nietzschean um, uh, aspect in how it. What? Nietzsche? Right? Went home, yeah, I don't even know this, went home, went on to the internet, and ended up with, with quite a long academic um, paper on just that question, how much was they actually influenced by Nietzsche, and found that there's quite, quite a lot of um, research going on into that question. I was wondering whether you might want to illuminate that for me. Well, the, 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 the young left is, is strongly influenced by uh, reading Nietzsche and, and, and as part of a, um, a, a, an emphasis on the instinctual, uh, the vitalist, uh, which all is there in the uh, of bar, of course, absolutely uh, there. Uh, and, um, and, and what I, I was thinking. I would say, before I say anything else, that there was a, a, a lot of misunderstandings uh, about Nietzsche and the German politics. Uh, and, and, and whatever the Nazis then may have been through his uh, sister, uh, the way she, she went about um, the uh, propagation of his works. If you, if you look at uh, one or two generations of German artists and intellectuals, uh, from the very late 19th century through to the 20s, then uh, the, the, the influence of Nietzsche is, is, is huge and it cannot be uh, reduced to a particular, particular political category by any means. It, it's, it, the the, the um, individualistic, uh, I don't know, uh, liberationist almost elements of uh, Nietzsche's work claiming that the, the, the individual as opposed to the collective, as opposed to Christian morality, uh, had a huge, huge resonance with um, almost everyone, uh, I would say, actually included. And, and um, when, when Caspar Nea, right, his close friend, was talking about um, Baal in a diary note, he, uh, he, 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 he made exactly these points about Baal that he was a, a vitalist uh, and um, highly individualized. 
embraces a number issue that doesn't we should begin to wrap up a little bit. So this is my closing statement. Just a little bit. And we tend to think of Brecht as a rationalist, and as someone who is putting across rational arguments and the whole project is to teach us and so on and so forth. But um, certainly in that early phase, there's a part of him also which is conscientiously going out to learn how to let himself go, how not to control. So there's, on the one hand, there's this desire to control and manage things and manage them rationally, think things through. And on the other hand, there's the acknowledgement, the simple recognition that in order to be creative, in order to do these things, there's a point where blind practice has to be let off the leash. And that's what he's working with. I was going to say playing with, but it's much more serious than that. That's what he's working with in those early years of Hubble. And I think we see that sort of um, alternation continuing through his later work as well. So Bard is a good place to start. Lots of critics for years have thought of it as a sort of useful work that and we should take with mature breath more seriously. But actually Bard gives us a window onto the rest of the work as well in a quite enlightening way. And having read and taken Baal seriously, you can see how in other works as well, they're not thoroughly rational, they're not pedagogically thought through necessarily. There are moments where he lets himself go out and as that in the Caucasian chalk circle for example of that. Um, so the one thing that I wanted to, to end with is um, it's a negative and you're never supposed to um, Catch your positives in, in negative terms. But Brecht was not dogmatic. We tend to have this image of him as, as, a, as a dogmatic teacher, someone who had a theory that wanted us to apply and that he applied to everything. His theory really doesn't work like this at all. Uh, thinking about this, I, I was struck by the parallel with Aristotle. He called his theatre anti Aristotelian. But Aristotle's the same. The image that we have of Aristotle is the image created in Renaissance Italy above of this dogmatist with his three unities and what you have to do and the prescriptions. But if you actually go back and read Aristotle, it's not like that at all. He's talking about practice. He never uses the word unities. He certainly doesn't say there are three of them. He's just saying that the place that seem to work best on the theatre that we use have these features in common. This is an observation of practice and an attempt to extrapolate from that practice are the general things that one can say about how the theatre works. And Brecht works in a similar way. He's not trying to formulate a theory which he can round down the throats. Quite the reverse. There's always this interplay with practice. And he never used his theoretical vocabulary when he was directing his plays himself, just as Tesson. He saw what came out of the production process, the rehearsal process. That was what was important for him. And the big difference that the theatre saw when they went to, when theatre people in Britain and elsewhere saw when they went to see the Berlin Ensemble was how much work had been done with the ensemble and how long they rehearsed on these things and worked out the solutions to problems rather than coming with the solutions and really working. And it's true in other respects as well. In his politics, he was in a club, carrying a member of the Communist Party. He was unorthodox Marxist. He kicked against the pricks. He didn't propound some sort of dogmatic version of Stalinism. And it's the same in his own plays as well. Again, people often come with the assumption that because he was a communist and because of who he was, he must be running his ideas down the throat. And there are plays. The mother is perhaps always the most spoken of them, where it seems pretty clear what the message is. But there are a lot of others where it's not so clear at all. Um, the end of the, the, the person said to him, where the actor turns to the audience and says, there must be a good solution, there must be, there must be. Lots of people write about that as if, it's just pretending here, of course we all know what the solution is supposed to be. He's told us earlier in the play, but he hasn't told us earlier in the play. It's much more difficult. And there's a much more real note of despair about what the solution should be. So yes, he wants to show us social problems, but no, he's not dogmatic about what the answers are. So did 
that produce problems in the relationship with the authorities? Yeah, yeah, absolutely do, yes. Well, we, we really haven't got time to go into that, but this is your special <laughs> that, That's where I, I first encountered the question. Well, what I was able to do in, uh, after the autumn of 1989 was to go to the archives in East Berlin, uh, and I worked there, uh, mainly on the history of these, but it became an artist in East Berlin, so it was a long relationship I published there, principally in East Germany, when uh, he was there, and uh, I, I was able to get the voices. Out, uh, and they charted a very fraught relationship, uh, I must say, between the authorities. Uh, an, an indication of this is that many people think that they went back uh, or went to East Berlin because uh, he didn't promise the DRW to be far down the way to home in Berlin or something. They only moved into that in 1954. He was only, prom he was only finally, uh, he and by the way, finally uh, awarded. After the events of the 17th of June, uh, when in fact the house had been earlier uh, promised to the garrisoned uh, people's police, the forerunner of the GDR army, uh, Brecht and Weigel had a year's contract uh, in 1949 uh, for that one uh, and, and things were so bad between Brecht and uh, the authorities that in the Autumn of 1950, uh, with no promise of a contract renewal, uh, they, they were staging productions, uh, camping in Rochester, after uh, He very devotedly went to uh, Munich for uh, most of the autumn and worked uh, with uh, his friends there. Uh, the, the, the antagonisms around uh, Recht. Um, came to a first head in early 1951 when he was in hospital and the party launched uh, the campaign against formalism then and he was the prime target in that in fact the production of the mother uh, was lambasted uh, as was then the um, production of <coughs> And, and um, th th there's, a, there's a long story here. The, the second wave of things uh, started as, as from the summer of 1952. The SPD resolved to proceed with the construction of the foundations of socialism, as they called it, to properly uh, then uh, found socialism in the GDR. I, I can't go to why the foundation has been cut. And, and, and Brecht and uh, people who were you know, modernist, avant-gardist in their attitudes uh, were all targeted as they had been in Moscow in the mid to late 30s, as they had been in the early 1951. And um, the, the, the Stanislavski campaign, the uh, sorry, Stanislavski conference uh, convened uh, in the uh, precisely East Berlin campaign arts, designed as an anti brecht anti uh, conference, uh, they, they, the, the theatre which they've been trying to get uh, was, as I said, uh, awarded to the uh, garrison police. They were left without the prospect of any theatre from uh, the later uh, The Brecht, of course, came out with a, 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 a statement of support for the GDR on the 17th of June 1953, and, and, and that has been held up uh, and then went in the face of everything else as the one thing uh, which shall not be forgiven. Uh, I, I think the balance of things is quite wrong, uh, and I'd be happy to bet that for a I think we should also thank you for being a wonderfully engaged audience. It's really nice to have it.